Inspiring you to set the marketplace ablaze in partnership with an awesome and limitless God. This is the Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur Podcast, and this isn't business as usual. Here's your host and Chief Fire Igniter, Shay Vines. Welcome back to the Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. This is your host, Shay Vines, and our goal here is to inspire you to operate your business completely yielded and in partnership with our awesome and limitless God. My guest today is leadership advisor and executive coach, Warwick Fairfax. He grew up in a prominent family-owned media business in Australia. And at the age of 26, he launched a $2.25 billion takeover bid that failed and led to him losing the 150-year-old family business. Now, as you can imagine, that was quite a setback for him, but it was also the beginning of new discoveries. We talk about his story, how he navigated such a significant challenge with God, and how God has led him to use his story to help others to experience rewarding new beginnings in their own leadership and life. So listen in and enjoy this conversation I had with Warwick Fairfax. Warwick Fairfax, sir, how are you? I'm very good, Shay. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it is a a delight. Now, for those who are already listening, we have an international audience, but they're already detecting your lovely accent. So why don't you go ahead and tell us where you are from? I am from Australia, from Sydney, Australia. So, uh, yep. (laughs) I love it. I that's on my list of places I would love to visit at some point is Sydney, Australia. Just the pictures are beautiful enough. They're kind of calling me over there. (laughs) Oh, it's it's a wonderful place. So as as soon as they open, which hopefully will be by the end of the year, right? uh, Come on down. (laughs) That's it. That's it. Well, I am delighted to talk to you. Uh, I I know a little bit about your story, and there was just so much in it that reminded me of just the goodness of God, the fact that nothing is ever wasted in the kingdom, you know, how we work through failures and how he causes all things to come together and work together for our good and his glory. And so I am just delighted to just kind of dig in and see what it's like for you doing business and partnership with God and just explore your adventures over the last how many years in business? Well, I guess uh, I started with the family business in uh, 1987. So I suppose you could say back then. So you got got long history in business. (laughs) All right. So why don't we start here? Because uh, the very, the, the very base of what I understand about your story is how it all started with you in this family business and a massive, what you described as a failure of what you experienced when you kind of took over the, re- the, the helm you know, of family business. So take us back there and talk yeah, yeah, to us yeah. about that. Yeah, well, um, so kind of the backstory is I grew up in this 150-year-old family media business. Um, it was started back in 1841 by, you know, an early kingdom-driven entrepreneur, believe it or not. He uh, came out from the UK. He wrote an article about a local lawyer that was proved to be accurate, but the lawyer sued him and bankrupted him, even though the judge said, hey, what you wrote was right. But, you know, sometimes justice yeah. uh, doesn't always work out for folks. Anyway, so he said, to heck with this and uh, moved to Australia. And he started this business in part with some... Um, help from the elders of his church. So he was uh, a great husband, great uh, dad, employees loved him. And he did things the right way, um, as I say, elder at his church. So that business grew from one paper, Sydney Morning Herald, by the time the 1980s happened. It had newspapers, TV, radio, magazines. It was a large, I don't know, $700 million company, 4,000 employees. It had the Australian equivalent of the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. The opinion leaders, the most respected uh, papers in the country. So come 1987, uh, my dad had died early that year. He was in his 80s. I was from uh, his third marriage. And um, there was a feeling by my parents the company wasn't being run along the vision of the founder, uh, as you would imagine, as families become wealthier and more established, faith become more traditional and not quite so Christ-centered, you know, yeah. money and uh, and faith don't always uh, mix too well. Um, and people, they weren't bad people, but it's just, um, 
seemed to have drifted. And so I'd spent most of my life preparing myself to one day take a leading role. So I, as I jokingly say, I made the mistake of being the good son, the words I worked hard, I didn't do dumb stuff, right. I got good grades, I went to Oxford like my dad and some other ancestors, worked on Wall Street, got my MBA at Harvard Business School. None of it because it's what I wanted to do, but it was like a duty on a country thing. I've never been in the military, but it's that notion. A bit, it's a bit like growing up in the royal family. I mean, can you imagine Prince William saying, I think I don't want to go into the firm, right. as, as they call it. It's like, right. I mean, Harry, obviously, he's taken a bit of a different path, and I That's sympathize. Right. It's pretty tough. Um, so come early 87, my dad died, I, you know, obviously feeling like management wasn't doing a good job, had issues with the vision. So in late August 87, I launched this $2.25 billion takeover uh, and pretty much went wrong from the start. Other family members sold out. They didn't want to be stuck in a privatized company controlled by a 26-year-old, which I can understand, frankly. Right. And we ended up having so much debt that despite management increasing operating profits, by late 1990, Australia got into a big recession, newspapers are cyclical, company went under. So here I was trying to make the company take over proof, trying to restore it to the ideals of the founder, a strong Christian, change management. And, you know, I never tried to hurt anybody, but my actions ended up uh, ending a 150-year uh, family company. So it was, I mean, to say the least, it was devastating on many levels. Uh, so financially, money has never been that big an issue, but it was more letting my family down, even right. letting God down. It was yeah, that, believe it or not, that is the Cliff Notes, Cliff Notes version of what happened. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot. I mean, when you talk about what, what that could have felt like, you know, well, you know what yeah. it felt like as you walked through it. But when I just kind right. of think about what that could feel like, the, the weight that that could have on someone, especially as young as you were too, you know, right. in your mid twenties to experience that. I have, there's a couple of things you said that I thought were interesting. You know, one is that it wasn't so much that this was the path that you desired or dreamed of or wanted, but it was almost like it was prescribed for you. So you were just doing the, doing the right family things, you mm -hmm. know, to position yourself to inevitably kind of take over the family business at the time that it was, you know, inevitably going to happen for you. So you already kind of had a path that was carved out for you. Now, when you were in the midst of that, were you feeling, were you excited about this path or were you, were you already kind of having kind of an internal struggle with like, I think there's more, I think there's something else that I desire, but I feel like I have to do this. Like, where were you in your heart and your mind at that time? Boy, that's a great question. Um, there certainly wasn't joy and excitement. It was nervousness and trepidation. Um, you know, it, it, it's funny, this anxiety actually, in some strange sense, brought me to Christ. Uh, when I was at Oxford, I went to an evangelical Anglican church and at a Oxford Cambridge retreat. Um, actually, a woman came up to me and when I asked for a Bible and said, uh, let's have a little chat, I guess it's a bit of a signal. And anyway, I just knew that I need Jesus in my life because of all the pressures that were to come. So I suppose that was helpful, but um, in that sense, but no, I never felt like I had a choice. I felt like it was prescribed from birth. And a weird way when in like late March 82, I came to, uh, you know, saving knowledge of, of Jesus it almost made things worse in some ways. Not that knowing Jesus is bad. I'm still a strong follower of him, but I, in, I think I kind of got the wrong theological message. It's like, gosh, the founder, John Fairfax, was a strong believer. It must be God's will, now that I'm a believer, to bring it back into being run with those sort of values. And you know, yes. obviously, one big lesson is don't assume you know God's will, even if you think it's so obvious. Clearly, if if it had been God's will, it would have happened and everything would have worked out. But that just, I mean, I felt like I had no choice. I felt like my prescribed destiny was etched in stone by God. I didn't want to let my family down, uh, the company. So, no, I had no choice. And the question of do I want to do this, I don't know that I wanted to, but I ignored the question because it seemed to be irrelevant. Right. It was my duty. And you do your duty no matter what, which... Duty is a good thing, except yeah. if you have it focused in the wrong direction or describe it in the wrong way. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, almost when I came to a knowledge of Jesus, it actually amped up the pressure even more in some strange way, at least how I like the God weight on it. (laughs) Oh my gosh. To the duty. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And for a believer, that's the ultimate weight, you know, because then then when it fell, it was like the most crushing thing. Yes. I didn't. I mean, did I disappoint family members? I mean, some of them sold out and got hundreds of millions each. So it wasn't like they were poverty stricken, but it was more the conflict and the instability, my family, but far and away, the worst was God had a plan for the company and I let God down. In the mm. 90s, that was absolutely soul crushing. That was the biggest crucible to come back from that I felt like I'd let God down. Wow. So what happened after that? I mean, when you're, how did you get out of that space and get to a healthy place with God? Like, what were the, some of those key moments that you had that, that helped you through that? I think I just... You know, when you go through a crucible, it can either take you away from your faith or make you want to sort of cling to the, the mast of the, of, of, the, of the ship and the storm and just cling even more, just digging your nails into the wood of the mast and say, I'm not letting go. And yeah. that was more me. And um, yeah, I just came to realize that God loves me and God loves all of us unconditionally. He doesn't need my stuff. We, we do things out of response and love to him. But we don't, we don't earn our way to heaven. It's called grace because it's grace. You, <laughs> right. you, don't, earn, you don't earn grace, you know? Yes. And so I just realized if he wanted it to happen, it would have happened. He loves me for who I am. He doesn't need some believer being in control of some big media company. I mean, I had people come up to me before the takeover saying, you know, older guys, believers saying, you know, we've been praying for, for decades that God had raised somebody up in the heart of the media. You're an answer to prayer. In hindsight, thank you so much. I mean, boy, more <laughs> pressure. Don't tell me an, of an answer to somebody's prayer. That is not helpful. So be very careful. Adding before. more to the weights. <laughs> yeah, if any listeners want to tell their younger uh, folks, you know, you're an answer to prayer, be careful about saying that. That's not always the wisest thing. And how, how do you know? Wow. But yeah, so it was tough, but it's really realizing God loves me unconditionally. Uh, you know, I clung to... Scriptures like 1 John 2.17, the world and its desires pass away, the man who does the will of God lives forever, you know, stuff like in Philippians 3, uh, where it talks about, you know, I count it as, as rubbish other than knowing you know, Christ Jesus is my Lord and Savior. So, and fortunately, my wife is a strong believer. She loves me unconditionally, my kids. I found meaningful work, but the core of it was realizing that that, you know, God loves me unconditionally, no matter what. Yeah. That was the core that I kept clinging to and clinging to. And I kept going over the scriptures, almost like a mantra, over and over and over and over again. Uh, and it like did help. your identity and who you are as a son and exactly. not all the things. E- exactly. Yeah, exactly. He loves me just because of who I am. He loves every person on the planet just because of who they are, a child of God. Yeah. So... Yeah, I just I just clung to that. I just dug in, dug in, dug in and, and clung to that thought. Yeah, that's so good. One of the things that caught my eye just in the introduction, you wrote this book called it's called The Crucible Le- The Crucible Leader. Yeah, uh, Crucible Leadership. You got Cru- it. Crucible Leadership. And there's yeah. this thing that's stuck out to me just right in the introduction and you said that you can't inherit someone else's vision. Like you can't inherit that. And that's and that's that's tied to, you know, what you were just sharing about. It's like you had, you, you took on the inherited vision, but hadn't had that opportunity to find out who you are, who, what you were designed for, how he created you, the assignment of God on, on, on your life. You didn't get an opportunity to do that or didn't know that you could do that before you had already inherited something to walk that out. So when did you begin to do that exploration where you're just like, wow, no, God's created me for, for something to be somebody to, to, to show up a certain type of way in the marketplace or whatever. Like, what was that process like for you? And when did that happen for you? Well, it was during the nineties, which I mentioned is, which was challenging. I ended up, well, started working in a aviation services company doing finance and business analysis. I remember thinking I must be the lowest paid Harvard business school graduate in history. (laughs) 
<laughs> and not that money is important, but it right. did it hurt my ego. Sure. But one of the turning points was I went to a woman that did uh, executive coaches, mid-career assessments. And she said, you know, Warwick, you had to have a good profile to be an executive coach. I became a certified international coach, federation certified coach. So that's, I came to realize that my design is not this, you know, Rupert Murdoch, take no prisoners, chief executive, I'm a reflective advisor. I don't like to be in charge of thousands of people. You know, I like to more coach and now write and reflect. And so, and then I ended up um, getting on two nonprofit boards, being an elder at my non-denominational church, and then on the board of my kid's school, which is a Christian school. That was a good fit being an advisor. So I came to realize that, you know, my, you know, I believe that God designs it's all a certain way. Yeah. And if he designs you a certain way, don't ignore your inherent design, because that's saying God is wrong, which yeah. is not a good theological place to be. <laughs> right. Let's, ju- let's just assume bad theology. That would be one. <laughs> let's assume God knows what he's doing. And if he wired you to be artistic, mathematical, you know, love ballet, love sports, be an engineer, whatever it is, accept that and try to live in light of that. And so clearly I didn't. I wasn't yeah. even thinking about that. Um, but that was that was the first step of just realizing I was I wasn't even living my dad's vision. He was living somebody else's vision too. It was somebody 150 years ago. Wow, a good vision. That's so true. But it and so many kids growing up, you know, maybe their mom or dad is a lawyer or a doctor, and hey, you got to do this because you'll earn a good living or an accountant. Yeah. Or maybe in the faith based world, hey, you know, we've had generations of there are some families generations of pastors in their family. Could be a small church. This is what we do. If you love God, you will be a pastor. Yes. Okay. And maybe in this church or maybe in the next town, well, it's not wrong, but there are other ways of serving the Lord other than being a missionary and a pastor. Yeah. That too can be seen as a family business. So parents mean well, but, you know, let your kids be who God designed them to be. Don't thrust your vision on them, no matter how well-meaning you think it is. So that was a huge lesson for me. Yeah, that's that's really good. And so you went into advising and to this day are you still are you still advising at this point? Yeah, I'm still an executive coach just because I've got, you know, a book that's actually by the time this episode has um will have launched, will have come out, but I'm really focused more on writing and um I do informal advising, but um yeah, I've done coaching for a number of years and being on boards, advising that way. So definitely yeah. enjoy that. So I'm curious, to, it was funny, as I was reading your book and you were sharing right on the front end, you'd said how when you felt like you should write this book, you know, you were almost like, who can relate to the idea of a multi-generational family business that, you know, you know, was like the top in this country and then I show up and then we have like who can actually relate to this right. story but you really felt like there's this you know there's a message here but I just don't know so I take take me through that I don't know whether it was yeah. like a holy spirit thing to write this book whether like how did this even come up for you and then how did you realize yeah. that there was goodness in here that people could relate to yeah it's a great question Shay so Kind of where it happened is at my own church in Annapolis, Barry Community Church, in 2008, the pastor was giving a message on the life of David. He was being pursued by Saul who wanted to kill him, uh, and he was hiding in the cave of the duel and feeling you know, sorry for himself. So he really wanted a sermon illustration of a righteous man, a righteous person, falsely persecuted. And I was like, well, look, that's not me. I've got a lot of trouble on myself, but and I'm not Mr. Charismatic kind of speaker, but I said, okay. If you want me to give a seven to 10 minute sermon illustration, what I went through when I, since it's a church, but I felt like God was teaching me, sure. And so what was amazing in the weeks and months after people came up to me and said, Warwick, what you said really helped me. And I'm thinking, how many former media moguls are there out there? I mean, <laughs> like none. I mean, it's, it's one thing if it was about being, I don't know whether it's a cancer survivor or alcoholism abuse. Right. Sadly, there are some crucibles that way too many people have been through. But this is one in which not too many believers have had $2 billion fa- business failures. Right. It's, I haven't found one. Maybe they're out there. If they are, please, please contact <laughs> me. You know, contact Warwick. 
they can put you in touch. But uh, you know, I'm guessing it probably won't happen. But you never know. You but, never know. Um, but yeah, so I never wanted to write a tell-all book saying I was right, they were wrong, because that's boring, lame, and untrue. But if if sharing my story can help others, that's worth the pain of writing. And imagine you're writing about the dumbest, stupidest mistakes you've ever done in exhaustive detail. I couldn't do more than a couple hours a day, and it's like, I'm done. This is too painful. But if it's in service of others, it was worth the pain. And so I do go into ex- I mean, it's more than just my story, but that's the anchor of it. But it was that message in church in 2008 when it's like, gosh, somehow people, I still find it mystifying to this day that people seem to find it helpful because, but somehow maybe it's sharing authentically, honestly, vulnerability, vulnerably, somehow they can, they can translate it to their own lives. Yes. That that was a revelation for me. Yeah, that's so good. Well, speaking of revelations, I'm curious because I know I experience this every time that I'm writing a book, but there's things that, so I grow in the process of writing a book. I either get greater understanding of a particular scripture, or I get a greater revelation about myself, or I get a greater revelation about God or something in the midst of just even the writing process. And I'm curious to know what you've experienced uh, as was it, is this your is this your first book by the way it is yeah, okay so as is. your first book you're like all right lord i'm doing this book with you <laughs> outside of the hard part of just having to like retell these stories about yeah. like a very significant hard time in your life what was like a what, what else kind of was some of the goodness of doing this thing with god and saying yes to this project you know, I think it's, I'm continuing to learn. I'd say even in the last few weeks or months, you know, we have our own podcast beyond the crucible and we had a, did a series on resilience and a couple of people said something that was really strange. Like one woman in the street was paralyzed in a pool accident, like at age 12. And she said, what she went through was a gift. And I'm like, how could being paralyzed be a gift? Uh, now, some you know we have people who are believers, not believers, but that's come out. That's come out a bit. So just this notion that somehow, you know, I'm almost reminded of the end of Genesis, like Genesis 50, when um, you know Joseph says something like, you know, they meant it for evil in terms of his brothers selling them to slavery. God meant it yeah. for good. It's not quite a one-to-one translation, but while it was painful. If the takeover had, if it had succeeded and I'd been in the family company or I hadn't done it yes. at all, I would have been wealthier, I guess, although we're still extremely comfortable. I would have been in this gilded cage, you know? I think, I don't know, I think if you ask Harry, for instance, I think he could probably identify with the notion of a gilded cage. Everybody looks at him and, you know, analyzes everything he does and, or any of the royal family. It's just, it's just or his mom, Princess Diana, it's just tough. Yeah. So, now I get to live my own life and the pain that I went through seems to be able to help others. So I can honestly say I've learned that there is a gift, even a blessing in the crucible, not that it's fun, yeah. not that you wish that on anybody, especially you know paralysis or other things, but that you can make meaning and purpose out of pain. Yeah. You know, and God can use the pain for his own glory and his purposes. Yeah. So that's something I'm have learned and am learning even recently. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, you know, you talk about this, about the crucible, and we've talked about one of those really tough moments for you that really stretched you and grew you. I'm curious what comes to mind. I mean, that was a pretty big, that's like a whopper (laughs) of one, to be clear. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, like, just for you to share another one or two that just kind of pops into your heart where you're just like, wow, you know, this was tough, but this is how God showed up through it with me and walked me through this. And here's what I learned from it. Like what comes, what comes up as another, you know, key moment for you? Yeah. I mean, part of it too, could be just the journey of writing this book. I mean, I started writing it in 2008 and it's only got published in 2021. You guys, That's like did you hear this? Wait, more wait, than wait, twelve wait, 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 years. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so you started this in yeah. two thousand and eight. Yes. 
this has been a this has been like a labor of love and of perseverance. For yes. You. All right, yeah. keep going. I just I, I want to make sure nobody missed that. that you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It has, and a it took I don't know four or five years to write, but initially I was thinking of publishing in Australia, and some wanted you know more of a tell-all book, which I'm not going to diss on my family and right. Yeah, it's just not what I'm about because yeah. I'm focused on my own mistakes, not you know anybody else's. Uh, that was a and word. Then it's like, <laughs> you know, that was thing from the Lord. But yes. and so then it's like somebody says, "Well, you need to you know publishers won't publish a book unless you have a brand." Okay, I have a Harvard MBA. I get that. So it took me a few years to build a brand and podcast and blog and social media, and eventually the Lord led me to a great publisher, Morgan James, is run by a believer. And because I wanted to do it a certain way. I didn't want to be pigeonholed. Oh, it's a leadership book. It's a faith-based book. It's a historical book. It's an autobiography. You know, it's like I knew what I wanted to do. And I, I was very clear what was on my heart. And I just, you know, I was not going to diss my family. Right. Um, I didn't want some publisher editing out God as scriptures throughout it. I didn't want a faith-based publisher saying, well, let's let's ditch the leadership stuff. Let's just have the scriptures. And so yeah, I mean, it was a labor of love and perseverance, but I just felt like I was trying to follow God each step of the way, and He's been faithful. And you know, you know what they say about God. You know, He He always answers prayer, but in His own time. So you know, it doesn't always happen in your time. So that was That's it. that was a long journey, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm so grateful that you know it worked out the way it did, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad I didn't try and cut corners and do a tell all or or whatever it was. So yeah, that's yeah. certainly, um, yeah, it's not the same level of crucible, but it was certainly a long, long journey to get it published. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. That's goodness. Oh, that's such thank goodness. You. I want to, I want to dig for a minute, if I can, around the work that you do as an executive coach. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, you know, when you made that transition to a, a different type of business, you know, and doing the type of business mm -hmm. that you do, what does it look like for you in a really practical way to do that business in partnership with God, you know, really led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I think whether it's being executive coach or even this book, this book is a good example. I got my first copies in, I don't know, April, May, something like that. And, you know, right there and then is I'm not tempted by money, but could I be tempted by given what I've gone through? And, you know, my Wikipedia entry was pretty much young, idealistic kid could have had it all and blew it. So, wow, there, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, it's gotten a tad better recently, but <laughs> it's like, could there be a temptation to sort of some redemptive thing? Okay, some, I wouldn't mind a little bit of respect. You know, a little sure. bit of, hey, you know, he's not just the screw up or something. Um, but when I got that book, I was like, Lord, I don't care. And I told the publisher, fortunately, he's a believer. I don't care whether it says one or 10,000. That's not about numbers. I want it to, I want to, you know, obviously glorify God. And I want to be faithful. Whatever the Lord wants to do with that, I'm fine. I have a great PR team and event management team, branding team, you name it, the best of the best. You know, we spend a long time on the cover of the book. I mean, everything. So I'm not, you either do it 100% and not at all. That being said, my, uh, my faith, my sense of self-worth must not be tied to the success of the book. Yeah. Must not be tied to how many people read it, come to events, uh, read the blog. So that's a key thing for me is decoupling your self-esteem from success. Yeah, you know, and so I've been. It's sort of almost a daily mantra, a daily. You know, I'm just very, very watchful of that. I do not want to be get tempted by having my self esteem based in numbers. Yeah, and so yeah. be faithful, and that to me, you know, the whole thing of what does it mean to be in partnership with God, be obedient to Him every step of the way, and leave the results up to Him. Yes. Do not have your self-worth defined by revenue, by earnings, by employees, by being on the front cover of Business Week on CNN, that God does not care about that stuff. So don't, and don't be tempted by it. And when you are, get on your knees and keep praying. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so good. Now, if you don't mind me asking sure. how, how, how old you are currently. 
Yeah, well, I turned, uh, I guess, in December 60. So hard to believe. <laughs> so first of all, you look great, by the way. But Thank it's you. like, do you do you feel, you know, it's like, it's like this, he, God's doing something new in you yeah. by, you know, having you release mm-hmm. this. Do you, do you have this sense of, I have a friend who's uh, in his early 70s and he says, I'm, I'm refired. He's like, I'm not, I don't retire. I refire. And he just has this whole new sense of like energy around what God's doing and great expect anticipation over what God's doing over his latter years and how, you know, he leaves us, you know, can leave a a mark and an imprint. I'm curious to know what, what you're experiencing in this season of life yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably exciting to be able to talk about this book to, interview others about their crucibles and um, offer some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's very, it's really, really exciting because, you know, one of the things I've thought a lot about as we live is, you know, in such a divided, chaotic world. And, you know, I'm very clear about my faith in Christ, but I say that your leadership needs to be anchored in something, could be Christianity, major religion, other philosophy. And young people today, they want meaning and purpose. They may not be churchgoers, but they're spiritual. And so when I'm talking about this, I've yet to find somebody that says, Warwick, well, I disagree with this. I may find somebody, but it's like, how do you disagree with life should be about meaning and purpose and significance, which we say life on purpose, dedicated to serving others. I'm not telling you what that means to you. You right. figure it out. Well, how do you disagree with that? Life should be meaningful and purpose as you define it. And everybody has a God-given right to define that for themselves. So that I find exciting. There's so much division here to be able to talk about something that people of all backgrounds, faith, uh, ethnic groups, races, genders, everybody can say, everybody's been through crucibles and everybody can say, I want, I want my life to count for something. Yeah. Everybody wants that. It's, yeah. You can't be human and not want life to have purpose. Yeah. Obviously, to me, purpose ultimately comes in the form of you know jesus but everybody has to make their own choices you know it's, it's a free world and as it should be god gives us free will that's right so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he did give us that <laughs> oh i so appreciate you sharing your story with us today and again congratulations on the book for those who uh first of all make sure to shout out the podcast again because i can't remember what the name of your yeah, podcast it's, it's is called- it's called Beyond the Crucible. Beyond the Crucible is the name of your podcast. Yeah. You guys check yes. out Beyond the Crucible. And then for those who want to connect more with you, uh, where do they go, Warwick? Well, the website is one place. It's crucibleleadership.com. And there's an info out there um, on LinkedIn under Warwick Fairfax. It's got a silent W in the middle there. Um, and then on Facebook at Crucible Leadership. So those are probably the main ways to kind of follow me. All right. Good deal. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Well, thanks so much, Shay, for having me. Really appreciate it. Fun conversation with Warwick Fairfax. And I have with me Mr. Bynes, our CEO, and my husband, so that we could talk some takeaways. What's going on, Mr. Bynes? All is well, but I'm I'm glad that Warwick pointed out that his name is Warwick with the silent W in the middle there. (laughs) Oh, because I probably just pronounced it wrong, didn't I? No, no, no. That's that's how you that's how you pronounce it. Oh, okay. But he pointed out he pointed out like when you're um, when you're gonna um, if you're going to check him out that when you write the word is with a silent W. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. I was I I thought that was like your loving way of correcting how I mispronounced this thing. Who am I to judge you on how you pronounce anyone's name? (laughs) I hey. Sometimes my my English is not really that great, so you know. Anyways, okay, so takeaways, takeaways take from the away. conversation. Yeah, so my first takeaway here is when you try to walk in someone else's shoes, they rarely fit. And so this came from when Warwick, Warwick was sharing that he felt like he had the ability to take over the work, the legacy that his grandfather had in the company. He felt it was his responsibility to do it. And um, it didn't quite work out the way that he thought it would. Which plays into my second point here. My second point here is we can't assume God's will. We have to discover it. So after he had the debacle with the company, um, he began to see what God had designed him for, the, the consulting work that he's doing now. 
Right. And he's well suited to be able to do that. But that came during a, a phase of discovery. So that's point number two. And point number three, share your fault one to another. And others will gain benefit from that. And, you know, my opinion is that it will allow God to remove the shame. And so that came from when he was sharing about his book and how he didn't really um, think that it was relatable because of, you know, the level that he fell from. Right. He didn't right. think that the average person would be able to to receive that. But people were receiving it and they received a lot from it. So, yeah. 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 Really good. And then to that that point that you made that you said was your opinion on the end. I mean, that's just the goodness of God. I mean, you're saying, hey, and I and I believe I believe that what you said is is right, too, because I kind of sense that from the conversation that we had, which is by, by him being able to continue to share that story, release that short story and and help others through that story. It's all, it also helps him. It helps him mm-hmm. to grow. It helps. I think I, I think the way you said it, it helps kind of release you know, shame around it or, yeah. you know, or anything like that. That's just the goodness of God when we are, when we're faithful to release the things that uh, he's given us to release for the benefit of other people. And I think a lot of people who are, who, who are, they're unintentional authors. Like they didn't necessarily think that they were going to be writing a book to help somebody in a particular area. They didn't know that they would be, you know, taking a story of theirs and then, you know, having something taught to others through it or helping others through it. I think that that's probably a relatively common feeling that people have, maybe not from the same perspective, because he does have a rather unique story, but we all do. And so, but there's something, there's always themes in there that are going to be of a benefit to other people. And uh, there's the beauty of what God does within us as we are, you know, obedient to just to write it out and to share and to help others through it. And so I just that last point all alone right there, I pray is like is freeing for some mm-hmm. of our listeners who are who are kind of pondering on that around their own stories and mm-hmm. some of the things that the Lord might be nudging them to do right now. So that's super. Yeah. good. Yeah, I heard a, um, a actually a few pastors say this, but. You know, a very popular pastor, uh, Bill Johnson, say the the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, right? Yeah, it's in the um, book of Revelations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that that also goes for when you're testifying about something that you've gotten over, the fact that you didn't die from this horribly shameful thing or whatever, you, you know, it's testifying to other people that, you know, God could do that again for you as well. So it doesn't only happen with positive things you testify about the good things that happen. When you testify about how you come through the, the negative things that happen, you're also releasing that same spirit of prophecy over people. That's good. Super good. All right. So before we take off, you all, if you haven't seen the announcements, we released a new course just last week. It's called the Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur Masterclass. We probably hinted about it a few times in, in previous episodes, but the course is now available. And I'm pretty excited about that. It's uh, we discontinued our Firestarter School course, which if you're if you're a longtime listener of this podcast, you've heard about Firestarter School many, 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 many times. But this course uh, is is our new one, our new release course that I'm really excited about, and I believe it's going to be very helpful to a lot of people who have just really been seeking just some more mentoring and some teaching and some guidance around what this really looks like. And how to walk this thing out as a kingdom driven entrepreneur, which is not the same as being a Christian who happens to be a business owner or even a kingdom citizen who happens to be a a business owner. Right. It's it's very specific what God has on his heart concerning being a kingdom driven entrepreneur. And so I'm excited that we're able to release that. You can get that at kingdom driven entrepreneur dot com slash masterclass. Mr. Bynes, is there anything that you want to share? Is there anything else that you want to share? Nothing. That's okay. it. All right. Well, from Team KDE to all of you who are in the United States anyway, have a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow, a blessed time with your family and with your friends and loved ones. And we'll look forward to talking to you all next week on the next episode of the Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. Take care, everyone, and God bless. 
Thanks for joining us on the Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, we encourage you to subscribe and spread the word. And don't forget, you can gain access to even more resources, plus a thriving community of fire starters by visiting our website at kingdomdrivenentrepreneur.com.